participate, another in a series of debates within the Department of Surgery between this time Dr. Uh, Veronica Zachary and Nadine Gates, who are both PGY4s and now pretty formidable scholars. And they will be taking up the subject of perforated diverticulitis. And Dr. Zachary resolves to take down the dogma of colonic diversion, while Dr. Gates will be the defender of the gold standard uh, colostomy in a Hartman's procedure. Uh, they both have overlapping studies reviewed by another of our local experts, Dr. Evan Zug, in one of his recent publications. So uh, this date debate will largely uh, focus on two different interpretations of the same data. Uh, so we want a good, clean contest this morning, ladies. No kicking, biting, or scratching. No hair pulling. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. Um, so the title of our Grand Rounds presentation is to anastomose or not to anastomose, a review and debate in the acute management of perforated diverticulitis. Um, and again, we'd like to thank Dr. Maxwell for his assistance in this um, presentation. We have no disclosures. Um, so these are the objectives. Uh, we will start with an introduction that will include um, some epidemiology on diverticulitis, uh, quick overview of Hinchy classification, um, and some historical perspective. Then we'll get into our debate, uh, which, as um, Dr. Maxwell said, will be um, Hartman's versus primary anastomosis for Hinchy 3 and 4 disease. Uh, have, we'll have some conclusions, um, uh, open the floor for discussion, and if we have time, potentially discuss some further controversies. So approximately 20% of people with diverticulosis will develop symptomatic diverticulitis. This accounts for up to 200,000 hospital admissions per year. Uh, surgical intervention is required in about 30% of cases, and if patients presenting with an acute episode of diverticulitis, roughly 1% will require urgent surgical intervention secondary to generalized peritonitis from free perforation. Um, the Hinchy classification of perforated diverticulitis is shown here for our medical students. Um, stage 1 is considered a small pericolic or mesenteric uh, phlegmon or abscess. Stage 2 disease is characterized by a distant abscess that may be intra-abdominal, retroperitoneal, or pelvic, and may be associated with a fistula. Generalized peritonitis occurs uh, with free perforation of a diverticulum and is classified as Hinchy 3, which is purulent peritonitis, or Hinchy 4, which is feculent peritonitis. So I thought it'd be important to look at uh, the history of the surgical intervention of perforated diverticulitis. It's important to know where you've been and the evolution of the treatment uh, in order to know where you're going. So all the way back in 1903 uh, at the 31st Congress of the German Society of Surgery, Dr. Milkelitz uh, described his two-stage resection and anastomosis. At the time, this was peritonitis. Uh, he was using this for peritonitis due to carcinoma. Uh, and perforation, and he resected the area and um, was doing double barrel colostomies. It wasn't long after that, uh, in the same decade, that this was adapted uh, to treat perforated diverticulitis. In 1910, Lockhart Mummery advocated for peritoneal lavage, drainage, and primary repair, um, but several of his critics noted that it's difficult to repair inflamed tissue, you might not even be able to see the hole that you're, um, that you're suturing and often not control the source because those sutures would not hold and uh, people would have ongoing leakage. In 1921, familiar name, Dr. Henry Hartman proposed sigmoid resection and in colostomy, but at that time that was his definitive procedure. He had no intention of reversing any of these uh, and colostomies at that, uh, for perforated diverticulitis. That was what you got. And uh, in 1924, uh, the Mayo Clinic did an observational study that drainage and suture of, uh, of colonic perforation with divert uh, sorry, diverting colostomy uh, decreased uh, mortality 
if you could divert. Uh, but they did note uh, several complications of uh, fistulas when leaving the disease segment in place, uh, which kind of supported Dr. Hartman's uh, sigmoid resection. In 1930, Rankin and Brown standardized a three-stage technique, which might look a little more familiar uh, to what has been done uh, recently in the past few decades. Their stage one uh, was peritoneal lavage with drainage of the abscess and a proximal colostomy. Stage two, elective sigmoid colectomy, approximately two to four months after uh, the drainage and control. And then a few weeks after uh, reanastomosis and your elective colectomy, then you would do your colostomy closure. This became the gold standards up until the 1950s, um, though in cases of fecal peritonitis, which you'll remember is Henchy stage 4, um, the transverse colostomy that they were doing was found to leave fecal residue proximal to the perforation, and critics said it led to ongoing leakage as well. In the 1970s and 80s, the Hartman procedure uh, regained popularity, uh, but at that time, reversal became increasingly routine. So this was starting to look uh, like the better way to go. Uh, and in 1978, that Henschey classification that we talked about became widely accepted to stage complicated diverticulitis. Um, and then in 1985, this landmark systematic review is really what pushed the Hartman procedure to become so popular and the gold standard. Um, Krakow uh, sorry, Krakowski and Matheson uh, reviewed 821 cases of Henschey 3 or 4 diverticulitis, and they thought that mortality uh, was more than half uh, if you resected the disease segment of colon. Advocates also argued that this avoided the risk of missed colonic cancer, which was found in 2 to 7 percent of patients at that time. The American Society of Colon Rectal Surgeons uh, puts out recommendations, and I thought we would just kind of go through the evolution of their recommendations over the past couple of decades. Um, in 2000, they stated that segment colonic resection followed by an end colostomy was the most suitable uh, for perforated diverticulitis with peritonitis. Again, Hartman's procedure, gold standard. In 2006, uh, they amended it a little bit and said emergency sigmoid resection is obviously deemed mandatory. But you had the option now of Hartman's procedure uh, or primary anastomosis with or without uh, diverting ostomy, but they weren't really pushing the primary anastomosis. That was just another option that you had. And then in 2014, a uh, direct quote from their, um, their recommendations was the surgical literature is replete with non-randomized studies supporting the idea that primary anastomosis in comparison with end colostomy is not associated with worse morbidity and mortality and may be associated with significantly improved morbidity and mortality rates. Uh, so they still kept it kind of vague, but now it, it, it seems like they're supporting primary anastomosis uh, could be done a little more often. And they even say also in that paper that primary anastomosis with proximal version may be the optimal strategy for selected patients which hit with Henschey 3 or 4 disease. Uh, and that decision uh, to create an anastomosis in the setting of peritonitis should be individualized to each patient uh, based on their uh, comorbidities in the situation. So now we will get into um, some journal articles and a little bit of our debate uh, and try to defend each of our sides. And and Dr. Gates will be supporting the Hartman's procedure, and I will be supporting primary anastomosis. Also remember that we are focusing just on uh, Henschey 3 and 4, which is purulent or fecal peritonitis. Um, so I'll start the debate with my first point in favor of Hartman's, and that is quite simply, as we've said, that is the gold standard for the treatment of perforated diverticulitis. Um, additionally, the Hartman's procedure, secondary to its technical feasibility, is most appropriate in numerous clinical scenarios where resources and experience may be limited, um, such as rural settings or ORs late at night. Um, furthermore, Hartman's procedure is the safest operation for high-risk patients presenting with fecal peritonitis where complete anastomotic dehiscence becomes a very real possibility. This is the 
first slide uh, relating to Dr. Zug's recent uh, article that he published. It's an update on the current, current management of perforated diverticulitis. And he had a very nice table in his paper that kind of reviewed the last uh, decade or two of studies comparing morbidity and mortality in patients undergoing resection and primary anastomosis uh, versus Hartman procedure. And these primary anastomosis may or may not have had a diverting ileostomy. The very first article on this is, I will not attempt to pronounce that gentleman's name, but it is a retrospective review of um, 15 studies with 963 patients uh, showing that mortality was reduced in the primary anastomosis arm versus the pouch. And you can see it's got the little asterisk there because that means it was significantly different. That's almost a three time, uh, ooh, a little pointer is not working, three times difference uh, in mortality. Um, and then you move down to Salem, another retrospective review. This was now in 98 studies with over 1,000 patients and showed about the same. That's almost double the mortality in your Hartman's arm when compared to primary anastomosis with or without diverting ostomy. In 2012, Ober Kofler and Binda both put out um, multi-institute uh, randomized controlled trials in 2012. So Oberkofler uh, had 62 patients, and they looked at both the first and the second operations, the second operation being reversal. Um, and they noted that in the first operation, meridian mortality was pretty much equivalent. Uh, There's not a significant difference there. But they did have increased rates of reversal uh, and reduced morbidity in the second operation um, in primary anastomosis versus a Hartman's procedure. Uh, it's easier to take down a diversity, or di sorry, diverting ileostomy than it is uh, to reverse the Hartman's. Uh, Binda also, again, prospective randomized trial in 2012. They now looked at 90 patients uh, and uh, showed non-inferiority uh, as far as mortality went with primary anastomosis when compared to Hartman's. And so I think this supports that, um, you know, in patients that aren't septic, primary anastomosis is not any worse than, um, than doing a Hartman's procedure, and, uh, and the patient's interest might be better for their lifestyle. We'll go over some more of that later in the debate. Um, so as far as these studies go, the first two, uh, as um, Dr. Zachary said, were retrospective um, and thus heavily affected by selection bias where lower risk patients tended to be treated with primary anastomosis and the higher risk patients with heart, making the outcomes for patients undergoing Hartman significantly worse. The randomized controlled trials by Oberkofler and Binda have also been heavily criticized because they were both terminated early. The authors themselves um, from the study by Binda et al. stated, no conclusions may be drawn on preference of one treatment over another from this randomized controlled trial because it was prematurely terminated following accrual of 15% of its sample size. They go on to state that a randomized controlled trial comparing primary anastomosis with sort of colon resection for perforated diverticulitis with peritonitis is practically unfeasible. Dr. Gates made some good points, but I have another article. This is the Diverti trial. It's a Hartman's procedure versus primary anastomosis for generalized peritonitis due to perforated diverticulitis, just like we've been looking at. Um, this was actually published right around the same time that Dr. Zug's paper was published. This came out in September of 2017. Their hypothesis was that primary anastomosis results in lower mortality than a Hartman's procedure and perforated diverticulitis. They were kind of spurred on by the findings of Oberkofler and Binda uh, in 2012, and so they wanted to do a trial to support primary anastomosis a little bit more. As a prospective multicenter randomized control trial, um, from June 20, 2008 to May 2012, they uh, collected patients that were found to have Hinchy 3 and 4 diverticulitis. Um, on CT scan and then would consent them uh, during that time. Patients were eligible as long as they were 18 years of age and were able to give consent. 
They accrued 102 patients, 52 of which were in the Hartman's procedure arm and then in the primary anastomosis. And uh, again, I like this. Um, this is another one where they compared the first and the second operations um, so that they were looking at reversal as well. So in the first operation, they showed mortality was actually higher in the Hartman's procedure uh, group versus the primary anastomosis group, but this was not significantly, uh, statistically significant. Uh, the data just was showing a trend that way. As far as severe complication rates and length of stay uh, and operative time, uh, there wasn't uh, much of an improvement in the primary anastomosis arm. It was about the same. Uh, and as far as the second operation goes, though, they noticed that there were much higher rates of reversal in the primary anastomosis arm with diverting ostomy. Uh, 17 of their patients that had Hartman procedures were never reversed, compared to only 2% of patients from the primary anastomosis arm. That's 35% uh, when you start to think of the lifestyle changes that are um, required in, in having an ostomy, that's kind of a big deal for some patients uh, if they're less likely to get reversed. They also noted much longer operating times for Hartman procedure reversal, 170 minutes versus uh, 70 minutes. So I think this supports that uh, primary anastomosis on uh, the, the appropriate patient uh, can be the way to go. You're in the operating room, you have, uh, you're more likely to reverse them and then during reversal, you're in the operating room for a shorter amount of time. Uh, so first, I would like to note that in this study, uh, while the reversal operation for the primary anastomosis patients was significantly faster, the operating time at the initial surgery uh, for patients undergoing Hartman's was significantly faster um, at 120 minutes. Uh, for Hartman's versus 175 minutes for patients undergoing primary anastomosis, which becomes especially um, important when your patient is sick. The 17 patients who did not undergo reversal um, after Hartman's procedure were um, older, so uh, they had a mean age of 78 versus 56. Uh, they lived more often in nursing homes at 12% versus zero. They had more comorbidities um, and more frequently required hospitalization in a rehab unit after the first operation um, at 71 percent of patients who weren't reversed versus 9 percent. Um, and for patients um, that did get reversed, um, they did not find a significant difference in morbidity uh, between those having a Hartman's uh, versus ileostomy reversal. And a limitation of this study, like the other two randomized controlled trials, was that the required number of patients, again, could not be reached at the end of the study period, uh, where they had calculated a needed sample size of 246. Um, and also, there was only one patient um, included in the study with Hinchy 4 diverticulitis, raising, again, the question of selection bias. Um, and if you go to the current up-to-date article on the surgical management of acute diverticulitis, there is a message at the very beginning uh, referencing this very trial. Um, and these authors state um, that until further available, um, they prefer Hartman's procedure for patients with Hinchy 3 or 4 diverticulitis. up-to-date article footnotes, a little shot in the heart, but that's okay. I'd like everybody to consider a case. Um, we had a 29-year-old gentleman presented with three days of worsening left lower quadrant pain. He had decreased appetite, nausea, uh, temperature max of 102 uh, that he reported. He checked at home uh, and came in. Had a CT uh, showing signs of perforated diverticulitis. Uh, but at the time, his white count was 10. He was afebrile on admission, so he was brought in and placed on Zosin, MPO. But his abdominal pain continued to worsen throughout the day, and the next morning, he was taken to the OR. However, reviewing his CT scan, you can see his abdominal wall is 9 centimeters. 9. That's a thick abdominal wall. So you have to consider, with an abdominal wall that large, 
is it conducive for a reliable ostomy? Is your ostomy going to retract? Are you going to be able to create an ostomy that's not going to have a lot of tension? going to have a good blood supply and not die. Um, and then as far as reversal, reversing this 29-year-old man, which he's so young, I imagine that he would want a reversal. Uh, and an abdominal wall that's nine centimeters is probably not going to be a, a picnic. Um, he's young and he's healthy, except for obviously his morbid obesity. Um, However, in the OR, he was found to have a Hinchy Ford diverticulitis. It was global contamination and, uh, with feculent material. So what do you do? I think, you know, everybody in this room would agree that in a Hinchy Ford situation with that much contamination, most people would go for the Hartman. But with that 9-centimeter abdominal wall that kind of throws a, uh, a wrench in the works, he actually got a primary anastomosis with uh, no divert, and he did have a slightly longer length of stay. He had drains placed at the operation, um, but he left and went home after 14 days. And as far as I know, his only complication was uh, a surgical site infection at the skin. A couple of sutures were opened, uh, and that was drained. And he has not had any other fallout from his primary anastomosis in the setting of a Hinchy 4 diverticulitis. So maybe we should be considering primary anastomosis uh, more often when we have these morbidly obese patients that we see so often down here in the south. Um, another point in the way of primary anastomosis, again, I just want to point out some ostomy reversal stats. Uh, morbidity is uh, reportedly 32 to 43 percent. Mortality has been quoted at 10 to 14 percent. And up to 50% of patients never undergo reversal, which is quite a bit. And if you recall from Dr. Soderstrom's presentation a couple of weeks ago, basic ostomy supplies cost approximately $1,500 a year. And that might not be a lot for the people in, that, in this room, but for our patient population, that might be a whole heck of a lot. And that's just the basic supplies. If you move on to pastes and ointments or they need special bags, um, for a better fit, uh, to prevent leakage and things like that. I imagine that these prices um, could double or triple easily. Uh, and if then you're a young patient and you have an ostomy for a long amount of time, then, you know, this becomes quite a burden over the years. And I would also just like to make a few points about quality of life for these patients, especially in the younger population. Um, a cursory YouTube search and found several people that were willing to speak out on life with an ostomy. This poor young lady had a six-minute uh, session on YouTube where she wanted to, the world to know about her ostomy leakage problems. She had an ostomy. The seal wasn't very great, so she had a leak. This led to skin breakdown. The skin breakdown led to poor seal. Poor seal led to more leak led to more skin breakdown. This poor girl suffered with this for months before anybody could figure out what kind of bag she could wear that didn't, that didn't lead to leakage for her. She didn't want to go out with her friends because she was always concerned about leakage. She had pain from the skin breakdown. Um, she ended up having to get a convex bag, which eventually fixed it, but I imagine that's probably more expensive than your average ostomy bag. So again, uh, she's adding her $1,500 bill after much pain and frustration. This young lady had several things that still bother her about her ostomy. She did say she's grateful because she knows my ostomy procedure probably saved her life, but she said just the day-to-day -day maintenance of an ostomy and someone her age, you know, her friends don't have to think about that stuff. Uh, it's just kind of some added emotional stress to her day. This poor gentleman had two years of depression after his ostomy because he was having a hard time forming new relationships. He felt like he couldn't tell his partners uh, about his ostomy and he kind of just shut himself off from the world. Um, that's no little thing, you know. You have to think about these patients and how they're going to deal emotionally with these. Um, this gentleman had some suggestions on pouch odor, another thing that maybe we just don't think about. And this poor girl had enough embarrassing moments with her ostomy that she put out a two-part series on YouTube. Um, anything from her ostomy making noises at work, which required her to then maybe break some personal boundaries and explain what was going on. She's a nurse. 
in a uh, children's hospital, it sounds like. And so sometimes she had to explain uh, some personal matters to the family and the and the children so they wouldn't be afraid. Um, and then also her, uh, she had a very animated tale to tell about her and her boyfriend, her brand new boyfriend. He was just trying to be playful, tugged on her shirt and popped off her ostomy bag, which then, um, as she said, she fell back very dramatic because she's a dramatic type person, was laying on the floor covered in her boyfriend was covered in stool. The bathroom and the shower curtain were covered in stool, and he ran out in horror. Um, and so, you know, she's obviously had quite a time. It's a 12-minute video about her embarrassing moments, part two. Um, and so you just have to think about these things. There's a lot for people to deal with. Um, it's, it's no small change. Um, and, and maybe we're trying to primary Leah Nastimos, um people a little more often, especially when they're younger and healthier. Um, so based on the trials that were discussed earlier, many patients who undergo primary, primary anastomosis still end up with an ostomy. Um, and patients with ileostomies are at higher risk for dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities. Um, and I would imagine that this last girl, Dr. Zachary, spoke about had an ileostomy, not a colostomy. Um, patients with colostomies, on the other hand, tend to have a higher quality of life, and most patients who manage their colostomies with routine irrigation are, can be essentially continent. Furthermore, a number of patients who undergo Hartman's may ultimately benefit from having um, an ostomy, given that many of them are elderly, debilitated, and end up in nursing homes. Lastly, in favor of performing um, Hartman's procedure is the dreaded complication of anastomotic leak that comes with primary anastomosis. Um, in the previously mentioned trial, two patients who underwent primary anastomosis had anastomotic leaks, uh, with one requiring reoperation um, and conversion to Hartman's, um, and the other was treated with a stent. Um, so for our conclusions um, on this debate, uh, I would say that the decision to restore bowel continuity following sigmoid colectomy for patients with diffuse peritonitis must incorporate patient factors, intraoperative factors, and surgeon preference. Um, and Hartman's procedure remains the gold standard and is the safest alternative for high-risk patients presenting with fecal peritonitis. And so now I just wanted to kind of take a poll for that patient that we had who had the nine centimeter abdominal wall, but a Hinchy forward diverticulitis. How many people would have primary anastomosed him? At like five, six? It's been a consideration. A, a bit, yeah, a big consideration. Yeah. Um, like it's just. You know, which weighs more? Are you more worried about that Hinchy 4 or are you more worried about that abdominal wall? How many people would have primary anastomosed with a loop colostomy diversion? No way. No way, no way says Dr. Nelson. Um, and so the Hartman's procedure people, who would have just done a Hartman's? All right, vastly more. Okay, and who just doesn't know? <laughs> Dr. Nelson, you can't vote for all the things. <laughs> Yeah. And his, I feel like the tension, the blood supply, and the reach all would have been terrible. One thing I wouldn't have done is closed the skin. You said you that had was to go his, back yes, and open, take some stutures out. I would not have done that. Okay. Uh, I think the pendulum is shifting on this. Uh, they presented a lot of good Osmosis is a good alternative, um, and they highlighted this, and I'll just emphasize it, at least from my perspective, you've got to pick the right patient, somebody in septic shock, somebody on pressors, uh, probably is not a candidate to have this done, uh, and the usual suspects for high-risk uh, procedures, the cirrhotics, the COPDers, um, the elderly nursing home patients, the congestive heart failure patients, uh, uh, and patients where you can't get uh, good tissue. I think the primary tenant uh, 
in considering an anastomosis is if you can get good tissue back to good tissue. And if you don't have that, you shouldn't hook them up. Bob, are you aware of, has any, or any of you, have, have anybody done any NISQIP uh, risk-related prospective studies? Uh, I mean, that to me is always the problem with this. The comorbidities uh, have such a, as you just said, have a huge impact on, on what you decide to do. I'm, I'm not aware of any NISQIP papers that have looked at stratification. But I mean, that, that's, the, that's the real issue is, is, are you really comparing an apple to an apple? Right. It seems to me. I mean, I don't, uh, what about it, Evan, when you did your study? I mean, is that not, is that not mentioned a lot in the discussions? I mean, I think you're right that this is, uh, you know, one thing that you can do, but you have to look at the patient individually. Yeah. yeah. There, so, haven't, there haven't been any prospective NISQIP studies looking at that. There are reams of retrospective studies now comparing yeah. this, and the risk stratification, the selection bias is huge. And they've tried to do several prospective studies, but the uh, this w we could use a, a little more detail on that. Uh, the accrual has been very poor because surgeons don't want to be random and don't want to be told what kind of procedure they're going to do. So the patient accruals are all uh, well below what they expected the rate was going to be, and the studies wind up getting closed uh, before they met their power analysis uh, calculations for how many patients needed to be in each group. And so uh, that they did mention that one of the authors uh, said that this is basically impossible to get this study done. Yeah, I, uh, that, I, that's been what I've heard. I've heard that discussion now for at least 20 years uh, about, uh, about the fact that you just can't come up with a truly randomized comparison of this, like you can with breast cancer yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yeah I want to make a couple comments. We actually had, <clears throat> we were actually part of one of these studies back when I first came here. It was a multi-institutional prospective randomized for Hinchy 3s, and it, we had the same problem. We closed it after about a year and a half. And so, uh, in some ways, I think we're asking the wrong question in the sense that the Hinchy classification is just one of many risk factors with regard to morbidity if you do a primary anastomosis. And so, I think to focus that one particular risk factor, we, we sort of lose sight. And I think your comment, uh, Dr. Maxwell, about sort of the selection and the reason why people don't want to be part is because we all really understand that. And so one comment that I want to make about stomas is, is even in a morbidly obese patient, if you mobilize the flexure and you, you have the left colon off of the middle colic, you can bring it out a foot and a half of fat if, if you really mobilize and, and put it in the upper abdomen. The same thing with an ileostomy. You can essentially do a long Hartman's and an end ileostomy. If you mobilize the entire right colon and you bring it up in the right upper quadrant, you can get a well vascularized stoma out. Now, it's maybe hard to pouch because of the contour, but, but I think we forget that if, if you really need to do a stoma, you can do a stoma. That, I was going to ask that question because I, I, I wanted to hear all of you to make some points and discussion about has the, uh, has the increased incidence of morbid obes obesity changed your concern approach? I mean, for you colorectal surgeons in particular, I'd like to hear all of you talk about it. Because now, that's, that's a real problem in my experience. I mean, back, I mean, and I, I, I mean, when I was doing it, I mean, when I was doing a lot of colon surgery, the thickness of the abdominal wall, the subcutaneous tissue of the abdominal wall really made a difference because the, the retract, it's not just a matter of viability, it's a matter of retraction and imper imperfect seal, as you said, about the ostomy and so forth, that really is a huge problem. Uh, well, there, uh, Dan and yeah, I'd like, Richard, is Richard still here? Yeah, yeah. I'd like, as, far, as far as the stomas, there's a lot of tricks on obese patients because one thing that Dr. Burns mentioned as far as the retraction, a lot of that has to do when a patient is laying down and th there's a different contour, there's a different way that the skin is compared to the abdominal wall in a very fat person. When they stand up, it goes very dependent. And so if you don't plan for that ahead of time, it's going to pull it in. So when you, when you make a stoma on an obese patient, you really need to come through the fascia and then go cephalad more towards the upper abdomen. So when they stand up and it goes down, 
it, it, it more equalizes where it is. So that's something you have to keep in mind. There's a lot of real important things to think about when you're making a stoma on a beast patient. Now, it also depends on what operation. If you're doing a J pouch and you can't have the ileum, you can't bring the mesonite up, it's extremely difficult, then you can get in a situation where you cannot bring up an, an ileostomy on an obese patient. But in those other situations, typically, if you do adequate mobilization and know where to go, you, you can typically get one up. I do want to say, though, that all that data you shared about how it's easier to reverse an ileostomy and um, it's harder to reverse a colostomy. In a really obese patient, if you're having to mobilize your entire right colon and bring up essentially an end ileostomy, um, and you don't have that nice little loop ileostomy that's so easy to reverse, all that data on reversal is going to go away. Now all of a sudden you're faced with a situation where it's extremely difficult, probably going to require an open operation to reverse the ileostomy in that obese patient. And so uh, your calculation about um, what's most important for this patient may change. I said medical legal issues of dealing with these patients making the wrong choice and then being criticized or maybe sued over attempting to do a primary anastomosis falls apart patient gets septic and dies so I just wonder about medical legal issues Did you see anything regarding that didn't even delve into that at all well I think uh it would come down to assessment of judgment, uh, whether or not you had risk factors and you hooked somebody up and then they had a failed anastomosis with multiple risk factors. I think there'd be some liability there, but if you had a safe uh, patient, didn't appear to be high risk and they weren't septic, I think that you've got a solid ground to stand on with the current status of the literature on this. Um, I, th I think that's one of those things that you'd be much more apt to be sued for not operating than for what you might do operatively. Or, or, or not. Because, I mean, you're going to be able to get somebody to defend it one way or the other. Now, that doesn't mean you couldn't be sued, but can they successfully sue you? You know, because you can find somebody as long as you've operated at the appropriate time. I think I, this might be a good time to point out this, this, this discussion is a good example for the benefit of the medical students and everything is we don't teach people how to do an operation. We teach you how to operate or give you the opportunity to learn how to operate, which includes judgment about what operation to do. Uh, so you've got to have within your repertoire a lot of different options. Uh, this is one that's probably as important as any I know about. I'd just like to add that uh, good judgment comes from an experience, and experience doesn't come from staying home. you got to be here to get that. Uh, I've got a couple comments, and I, I agree with Dr. Burns. I, I, don't, I don't do colon surgery anymore, and I haven't done any colon surgery really in 12, 14 years, but in my younger days I did a hell of a lot of it, and I enjoyed it. Um, but trying to get an ostomy up in an obese patient is tough. And so I would tell all you residents that are around an operating room, if this comes up, be in the operating room, watch how Dan Stanley does it, because he's got some tricks that I've never heard of. And um, it, it's a real problem getting an ostomy up in somebody who's obese. One word of wisdom I, I would impart to you about Hartman procedures. When I was a chief resident one time, I had an opportunity to try to go dig a Hartman procedure out that had been done about a year before. And they did not tack the rectum up to the sacral prominence. And it had fallen back in the pelvis like an accordion, a collapsed accordion. And I'm telling you, that was one of the hardest damn things I tried to do when I was a chief resident, is trying to get that rectum up out of the pelvis so that I could anastomose it to some colon more proximally. So my advice to you if you're going to do a Hartman procedure is that you tack the rectum up and keep it stretched out so you can come back and deal with it much easier uh, on a second operation. The other thing that, that um, well, I just, um, I, I agree with what Mike Greer and I, sometimes when I'm trying to figure out what to do in the middle of the night, and I'm not sure exactly what to do, I, I really think about how some guy on the other side of the argument would be telling some plaintiff attorney how I did something wrong. Sometimes it kind of helps me try to figure out what to do in the middle of the night. And 
I can tell you, I came through the era just like I think Dr. Burns did, Dr. Greer did, Dr. Arnold did, where a two-stage procedure was kind of what everybody did. Now, one modification of that, and Coleman Arnold just did this for me two weeks ago on a man, and he survived. He took a man with a colon perforation in the operating room that was on two pressors and a ventilator. And what he did was he resected the perforations and waited 24 to 36 hours and then brought out a, an ostomy. Now, what he could have also done, because he didn't have a lot of peritonitis, is waited 24 to 36 hours and come back when that abdomen was still fairly fresh. And if he had found a proximal colon and some rectum that was reasonable, he could have done anastomosis then when he was off of pressors. And that's a modification of what y'all were talking about. So you don't have to do the ost uh, you don't have to do the Hartminger, but you you're not trying to do too much surgery in the face of somebody who's critically ill and trying to die. So I, I would offer that out as a as another option. I, th I think damage control in the face of severe feculent peritonitis with a septic patient uh, uh, on pressors is uh, pretty commonplace in tertiary facilities. At this point in time, I think the trauma damage control procedures have, have merged over uh, into the realm of general surgery and the critically ill, um, and I think uh, we do that routinely. Uh, the uh, concept of doing an anastomosis two or three operations later, I think, is still very highly controversial. Uh, I can think of a patient here, not of my own, that that was attempted several years ago and it didn't work. They leaked. Uh, so when you have uh, inflamed uh, peritoneum and septic shock, I think your healing potential is is decreased. And I would proceed at doing a staged anastomosis for diverticulitis in somebody that was septic very cautiously. Bob, one of the, this, this is just a, a point. I, I forgot which one of you made the point, but the two to seven percent incidence of it being a perforated colon cancer. Just keep that keep that in the back of your mind if you're going to do much of this, because if you have one of those patients and you don't resect it, you, the 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 idea that you just go in and do a diverting ostomy and don't resect it or don't determine that that's what it is. Keep in mind that not every perforated colon is diverticular disease because uh, I've seen a couple of those and right. and uh, those kind of situations are horrible because they don't colon a lot like breast cancer it doesn't always spread to your liver and lungs and kill you uh, it just uh, yeah. keeps growing locally and when that starts to happen it really becomes a miserable yeah. existence. I, I think all this debate is off if you think you have a perforated colon cancer and not perforated diverticulitis and I think if something doesn't smell right, uh, check a CEA on some of these people. If they haven't had a colonoscopy ever, the story is more chronic with some obstructive symptoms playing into it. Uh, rather than an acute presentation, you need a specimen on the back table and see if you got a colon cancer because you might want to lean more towards a diversion, I think, in that setting. Uh, at least that is not as well explored in, in my knowledge base of hooking somebody up that has a perforated colon cancer. Love well, or or, or, or certainly people. have a plan to get that resected, if nothing else, just to get rid of the cancer because a, a, a chronically bleeding rectal or colon cancer is a miserable existence for that patient, even if they die. It's a miserable way for them to die. The other uh, thing where this uh, colon cancer comes up that they we're thinking about touching on is a laparoscopic lavage, and even in our own experience with that, 10% of patients that had a perforation that underwent a laparoscopic lavage at this institution wound up having actual perforated colon cancer in face of having multiple diverticuli in the same area. So that that's another snake out there you got to look out for. In that circumstance, uh colorectal guys at what point after this acute issue do you advocate doing some form of endoscopy to determine for sure that you're not dealing with the colon cancer as well you know what I'm talking about I mean it, saying if they have not been resected well I mean do you ever not resect 
No, I would always resect them in okay. the uh, primary setting. And if there was some concern, I'd just make my um, vascular division much more proximal to encompass all the uh, draining lymph nodes. Well, that, that's what I would have thought too, but I just wanted to make the point that in the, in the era of just doing a, you know, a washout and a diversion and planning to come back at what point you, you look at it, you know, even in the very elderly patient, that sort of thing. Yeah, just don't forget weeks, that if you left it weeks. in, it might be a cancer. I, I, that's yeah. the point to make. Or washout, yeah. Right, okay. yeah. Um, I had a question for the panel and for, again, any of my colorectal partners. If you are going to do a primary anastomosis in an unprepped bowel, what good does that diverting loop ileostomy really do for you? Or are you planning to do some sort of on-table lavage to really get the colon cleaned out? Um, I don't recall from those papers whether or not they did an on-table lavage. I don't think they did. In the Diverti trial, it was up to the surgeons whether or not they wanted to do an on-table lavage. Um, they didn't really get n give numbers on which surgeons or how many surgeons decided to do that. And that was a concern um, just from the historical perspective. Like I said, you know, you do that proximal uh, diversion, and you still have that... that um, fecal contamination um, that could still go if, you, if it's not controlled that you're in asthmosis. How do, how do you do that? Somebody who's done it can explain how you do it. I, I I've never yeah, I'd like to know that too. Yeah, so we used to do this more frequently, I would say 15 years ago, and what you do is you get some anesthesia tubing, and you, mobile, you have to mobilize the colon well. You've got to get the whole flexure and get it all down so that you can essentially get off the side, and then you take some one of those... Uh, ties that you use with the trach and you put that around the outside of the bowel with the tubing and then essentially you get into the appendix so you again have to mobilize the cecum you put a Foley catheter through the appendix and you, r you run several fluid and you milk the stool and everything out into a bucket and so you can get them real clean but it's it's it, it adds you another you know 45 minutes to an hour at least to, to your operation and, and then there's a question of really, does it really help? So people have gotten away from on-table lavage. And I agree, this, this idea of a, a colon full of stool and you do, do a diverting ileostomy, how much does that really help? I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question. We know in people with prepped colons that are high risk, such as, you know, have had previous radiation or whatnot, it decreases the septic complications associated with a leak, even though it doesn't decrease the risk for leak. So... So I think that's a big gray area that we just don't know the answer to. That really received a lot of discussion for a while, about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, that, was, that was the mantra of the day, is that's what you needed to do in order to decrease the incident. I wish you all could have seen Dr. Arnold while you were doing that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll throw another... Uh a point out here on, on this discussion of uh, some kind of bowel prep. Um, we've had several patients that come in with uh, distant free air and free fluid that aren't toxic that uh, we try to manage non-operatively with antibiotics and they seem to not improve but they still have bowel function or they've come in with a perforation and we put a drain in it and they still don't act like they're getting better. We've had a limited experience now of giving patients uh, a bowel prep uh, prior to taking to the operating room. If they don't come in crash and septic and they still and they don't have an ileus, uh, I think uh, I've now bowel prepped about three people that came in with perforations and got them cleaned out pretty good. I was up there several times checking them to make sure the bowel prep didn't exacerbate their peritonitis and make their leak worse. And I, was able to do that. So uh, the on-table lavage, there's actually a CPT code for that. So people have done it extensively enough to get it registered with the people that make the coding manual. But uh, as Dr. Stanley, I think he alluded to, it's kind of a pain, particularly somebody that's got a colon chock full of, you know, hard stool. It's, it's a challenge to do that without tearing the colon and creating further soiling, I think. I've done it some. It's my favorite thing. Dr. Stanley? Yeah, just a brief comment. You brought up the idea of, of distant free air in a patient who does not have diffuse peritonitis, and for a reason I maybe we'll share at some point and do a discussion on. 
um, that is something that actually has recently come about since about 2011. Matt Much, who used to be at Vanderbilt, uh, published pretty much the first really good retrospective paper on that. And then there's been papers also out of, out of uh, Europe and then a couple others. And even in the most latest, the latest uh, practice parameters of, of the ASCARs, they have added a section there that's saying that in highly selected patients that those pa patients can do well without an operation. And about 90, a uh, couple of the papers, 90, over 90 percent of patients actually did well without an operation if they fulfill the criteria of, of localized. But it's interesting, your, your thought about prepping them and having a low, uh, a low sort of threshold for operation is something that really hasn't, wasn't discussed in the literature, but, but is, I think, a reasonable approach as well. Got a boat full of patients now that have come in with distant free air that we've managed, um, you know, non-operatively and have done well. To track those people down, we could probably have a decent you know, number of patients for a review. What kind of prep do you give them? Do you give them Golightly or what do you do? Miralax is what I've turned okay. to. Yeah, it's a little more palatable for them. Uh, free air up under the diaphragm, around the liver. Yeah, just free bubbles air. of free air, not massive free air, not but right around the cold. Five, six bubbles of free air, and their pain is mostly still localized to their left lower quadrant. This one of those circumstances where the old uh, adage that you always operate on a patient with free air in the abdomen has has gone away. I mean, yeah. you, you exercise some judgment in that. Uh, I think that's a point to make to people too. It's not an automatic to operate on those patients, but once again, <laughs> you're, you're much much more apt to not be criticized for operating than you are for not operating. I think some of this free air bubbles that we sit on are because of the better resolution of CT scans that we may not have detected the free air bubbles before, and now we see them and we've learned that we can uh, try and sit on some of those folks and prevent them from having to get a, a diversion. I think those patients in my uh, criteria, uh, even if they don't wind up getting a drain, have complicated diverticulitis and if they're an appropriate surgical candidate, I think they're at increased risk for having recurrent diverticulitis and, you know, if, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll discuss an elective resection with those patients. So maybe the uh, laparoscopic lavage will really go away because that subset of patients, usually with a little bit more generalized pain, are the ones that I was doing laparoscopic lavage on and maybe any operation at all. Um, if they, they don't have hemodynamic changes and they got a little bit of free air and free fluid, we'll sit on them and if they don't get better in a day or two, then that's when we have used the lavage, I think most frequently not out of the emergency room. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, I've incorporated the hydro pneumatic tests. I'd put the proctoscope in them and blow their rectum up and see if I get air bubbles when I do a lavage and if that's air leaking, then I think that's a, you know, you need to resect that and figure out what you're going to do. Just, I would say things are rapidly changing in this area, and I think a lot of these questions you're, you guys keep an eye on because as far as who really needs an operation electively later, you know, who needs one right away, what do you do with distant free air, all those things in the last five or ten years have been changing dramatically, and I think they will. In fact, if you look at the recommendations by the trauma, unless they've changed it in the last year or two, they still recommend surgery on everybody with free air on plain films. They haven't even talked about the difference between plain films and when they're got that and when they get plain films, that was old criteria, and now the CT scan. So even that has really changed. So this is a great topic because there's a lot of change you need to keep up with. Yeah. It's like, it's like in the susception that we see. Did you want to make a point here? I got a comment to make at the end. Oh, okay. This is well done. Thank you, Bob, for moderating, and uh, thank you. Thank the ladies for, for a erudite discussion uh, on. Yeah, excellent uh, debate, uh, surgeons there. Kept it clean. Yeah, he Sh shared the same slide deck even. <laughs> so I um, wanted to remind everybody Skills Lab to, uh, tomorrow uh, is for twos and threes. So if you're a two or a three, please try to make it there. It's going to be laparoscopic 